Testament reading this morning is from Exodus 34, verses 29 to 35, the shining face of Moses. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hands, Moses did not know that the skin on, of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with the Lord. Voices from the past. Voices that have guided us, led us, encouraged us. Think about those voices in your life. Think about the people that have helped you become who you are. Whether that be family or friends, church family, Think about the voices that have contributed to your growing, not only in your faith, in your own life as well. Think about how the voices in our own lives connect us to the things that have gone before us and also help us connect to the things that are about to come to us. Those voices mean something. I think about Jesus on the mountain with Moses and Elijah and the connection that Jesus has to the Old Testament. I want to think about that today as we look at this passage, as we think about the transfiguration of our Lord. That, that's such a strange word to begin with. Somebody asked me, a, a little voice asked me if it means that Jesus transformed like a transformer into something else. And I said, well, n not really, no, but kind of. Jesus was not the same when he came down from that mountain. And I think the voices that he heard up on that mountain had a lot to do with that. Let's read this passage. Let's put ourselves in the place. Let's put ourselves on that mountain that day. Luke 9, 28 through 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, the Beatitudes, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days no one, no, those days told no one, no one, any of these things they had seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I think it's important for us to recognize the first thing that Jesus did when he came off that mountain. The lectionary incorporates it into this passage. I didn't read it, but I want to tell you about it. Jesus came down from the mountain with his disciples, and out of a crowd of people that were waiting for them, a, a father came and asked Jesus to come and heal his son who had an evil spirit in him. And Jesus did that, but Jesus made the comment, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear 
with you. Bring your son here. And he did heal. He did heal. But Jesus knew that things were going to be different once he came off that mountain. Jesus knew that God had something else intended for him. We're connectional. We're Presbyterians, which means we're connectional. We're part of something greater, a larger body of church. Our church doesn't just exist here. This is an important part of church. But for us, we're connected to sanctuaries and worship services all over the world, Presbyterian and not. We are a part of a cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. As Luther would say, we're a priesthood of all believers, which means that every one of us are called to serve in ministry. Every one of us are called to be a part of this connection that we have. What connects us to the past? These voices, those that have gone before us. Now, there's a mystery involved in this, and that's the first thing that really stood out to me when I was thinking about the transfiguration story is the mystery of faith. I wish I could be on that mountain. I wish I could have heard the conversations between all the parties present, but I know we can't. I know there's a mystery involved in this narrative. I know that we're not revealed everything that I would like to know about what happened on that mountain, but I know, I know that God's purposes were served. Are you somebody in your own faith that has room for the mystery? Can you live and sit with the mystery of faith that we don't know everything, that we're not God? John Calvin would often say that, talk about the mystery of faith and say if we knew everything, then we would be God. There are things about faith that we don't know, that we can't comprehend. There are things about the future that we don't know because God hasn't revealed it to us yet. There's a mystery involved. And I think there was a mystery that existed on that mountain of why Jesus had to do what Jesus had to do, why God called Jesus to do, to walk this road to Jerusalem, which wasn't an easy road for him. But he did it for us. The mystery is what makes the story intriguing, but it doesn't give us everything that would possibly satisfy us. I encourage new Christians, when I talk to them, don't let the mystery of faith set you back. Don't feel like you have to figure out everything that has to do with our faith because there, there's just too much. There's just too much. There's a mystery to God, a mystery to the presence of faith that's important in our lives. And I believe that mystery got the disciples when they were on that mountain too. One thing we do know is that those that came off of that mountain that day will never be the same. That even in God's mystery, we are changed. Luke says that while he was praying, while Jesus was praying, his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. The glory of Jesus shines through this story, illuminating and highlighting the divine nature of God. While he was praying, let's remember that. I don't want to pass over that too fast. They went up to the mountain to pray. While he was praying, his face was changed. While they were praying, they saw Moses and Elijah. While they were praying, the cloud came. God can do some wonderful things while we're praying. God can do some wonderful things. We were in adult Sunday school, what, three weeks ago? And <laughs> I'm not over it. We were in adult Sunday school three weeks ago and we talked about the power of prayer. And we talked about Kierkegaard's quote that says, prayer doesn't necessarily change God, but it changes us. The process of prayer changes us. Maybe sometimes that's what we need. But Jesus standing on that mountain the mystery surrounding that interaction, the disciples. And we finally see Moses and Elijah standing there with them and we're realizing that Jesus is connected with the past. The presence of Moses and Elijah, their conversation with Jesus is evidence that Christ has come to fulfill Israel's laws and prophecies as well, that there is a connection from the past that is driving Christ, that is driving God for a future, for a hope, for tomorrow, moving forward forward with us. I encourage you as you think about those voices from your past, the voices that you listened to or didn't listen to, how have they helped you move forward in your faith onto the next step, onto the next journey that you are a part of now? And what does that say? Maybe you're the voice for somebody moving them forward at this point. But I think as we put ourselves in this mountain, we're not Moses, we're not Elijah. I don't know that anybody could make me feel pretty good about the news that Jesus got 
on that mountain. But if you were going to get news like that, I think Moses and Elijah would be the right people to tell you. But I think if we were to put ourselves on that mountain, we're the disciples. We're the disciples. We're the ones that, that want to cling to Jesus because sometimes we don't listen to the voices that are around us or the voices that are meaningful in our lives. Sometimes, sometimes we have a way of shutting out the voices that we ought to listen to. That's human. That's human. Peter, James, and John, what was their first reaction when they saw Jesus, when they saw Moses and Elijah? Peter is just like us. He wanted to cling to Christ. He wanted to build a dwelling. Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let me build a dwelling. Let's celebrate. Let's have a festival. Let's, let's do it right here. That's our instinct. When we're up on that mountain, we want to cling to what is good. My pastor would always say, sometimes you have to say no to what is good in order to say yes to what is best. Sometimes you have to say no to what is good in order to say yes to what is best. That's not easy to do, friends. Peter scrambles to his feet, offers to build these booths in the tradition of the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles. He wants to be there. He wants to, he wants to pull out the red carpet. But then the cloud comes, and this is where the Bible's comical. If you don't see some comedy in this, the cloud comes and rebukes Peter and says, no, this is my chosen one. Listen to him. Listen to him, really, you should. He knows what he's talking about. I imagine it quieted Peter down. I imagine it quieted him down. It's as if that cloud said, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. These voices in the past are moving us forward. God speaks through those around us, through our communities, through our connectional church. And God lets us know that at some point we walk down from that mountain, but we never walk down alone. We can't stay there forever. We have a mission. We have a purpose and a task. Which comes to my favorite point of the Transfiguration story. One of them, there's so many here. I could spend three weeks on this. That anything is possible. The transfiguration of Jesus, my favorite thing about this, the transfiguration of Jesus offers us a glimpse at what is possible not only for Jesus but for all of humanity. All of humanity. There was a church in the Bronx I read about and they actually called themselves the Transfiguration Church. You can read about this in a, in a commentary, in the interpretation commentary. And the pastor there talked about how the church really wanted to reach out into their own community, but they couldn't do it sitting in their own sanctuary. They had to open their doors. They had to take a risk. They had to, they had to do what was abnormal in, in their little bubble of community, and they had to take a risk. And what they found was that God transformed them, transfigured them. God gave them the gifts and the tools to be a presence in the little neighborhood community that, that they never had before. But it was risky. Because they said in an article, they said they could have stayed on the mountain forever because what? The mountain's comfy. I could build the dwelling place and be here with God. I can do that. But that's not what we're called to do. That's not what we're called to do. Eventually, we come down from that mountain and we move. And we keep moving. We keep moving. The story of transfiguration of Jesus is about that. It's about Jesus being identified, being a connectional point between the Old Testament and what is to come. And it's a connection point for us as we enter into the season of Lent next week. Yes, it's Lent already. And we will look inside and we will look introspectively and we will reflect on our own spiritual lives in the next six, seven weeks. And we will do that knowing that Christ has come down from that mountain, leads us, walks with us, and we are not the same people as we were before. That's the beauty of this, friends. That's the beauty of listening to the voices of our past and knowing that God is the God of our future is we don't have to be the same because God calls us to something greater. We don't have to be like everyone else. We don't have to be like the world tells us we need to be. We're not like every other organization in town. We're centered around the Word. We're centered around God. We move and breathe and have our being because of God. So I pray this Transfiguration Sunday, however you want to look at it, 
I pray that it is a vision to carry us down from the mountain, a glimpse of the unimagined possibility at ground level together as we walk forward in this world full of mystery, full of connection, but full of life. And all God's people said, Amen. Let me pray for us, friends. I'm excited, O Lord, for this season of Lent that is to come. I praise you and thank you for the word you've given us today, and I pray, God, that wherever we find ourselves at this point, whether we're up on the mountain, God, whether we're climbing down, or whether we're at ground level, facing the challenges of everyday life, we know we are not the same people that we once were. You have transformed us. You have given us perspective and purpose, love and life. I pray, God, as we worship you and we praise you, that we acknowledge the cloud of witnesses that exist around us. In the name of our Lord and Savior, amen.